Welcome to the Songwriter Theory Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Vidala, and we're going to talk about music theory, lyric writing, creative productivity, inspiration, and more. I'm super excited to have you here, so let's dive into the episode. Hey, friend. On today's podcast, we are going to talk about the golden rule of arranging. And that golden rule is not that everything you arrange is in the same key, because that is what we call a given. (laughs) So hopefully um, you have an understanding of music theory enough to understand that if you're in the key of C, doing a guitar part in the key of C sharp major is probably not going to work. So that is a given. And now what we're going to be talking about today. So we're assuming you know that. And from there, this golden rule is that everything has its place. So in arranging, um, it's very much team over self. Even the way one mixes a song is that you're not making each part sound its best on its own. The point is to make each part sound its best within the context of the mix. And arranging is very similar in that way. And often you're arranging for the sake of a recording, which makes sense. And even if you're not, you're always arranging for the sake of, you know, something sound, right? Like, even if it's live, that's usually going to be mixed and it's going to be heard by people. And the point is for everything to have its place. So there's three main ways to give everything its place. And we're going to go through those three. So the first one is to have its place in the pitch spectrum. Um, So think of it sort of like your calendar schedule. You can't really double book. And so if you have a work day from 8 to 5 and you have meetings all day, you're not going to put all of your meetings at 12 o'clock, right? You can't have four meetings at 12 o'clock because it can't be four places at once. So you spread it throughout the day, right? You have a meeting at 8 real early and then you have meetings sort of early-ish at like 10 and then you have maybe you have one over lunch and then you have one at two and then three you spread it out right because you can't you can't have your attention on four meetings during one time block so it's sort of the same thing with the pitch spectrum if you have everything you know within one octave of middle c it's just going to be muddy and gross like like you need to spread out the attention so if somebody's sort of tuning in their ears for a certain um octave say they will you know be able to pick out an instrument that is predominantly in that octave now i'm not saying that you can only have one instrument per octave um it depends a little bit on which octave it is uh because lots of songs tend to be mid heavy so for example if you have a song with piano and you know, bass, drums, and uh, guitars, especially electric guitars and acoustic guitars. A lot of those instruments, so like your electric guitars are going to be very mid, usually, depending on the guitar part. But especially if they're like power chords, they're going to be very mid. Uh, piano parts are usually very mid. Um, a lot of the vocal has some mid in it. You usually cut out the mids a little bit to give clarity, but there's still a lot of mids. Um So mids are extremely just heavy in a song. So the amount of instruments you can have in that mid range is more than say you would want to have in the bass. You probably don't want three different bass parts or parts that are, you know, really down there. Usually you have the kick drum down there, give it its own space, and then you put the bass, you know, a little bit above that or something like that. So, um, when, when thinking about this pitch spectrum, you need to just be thinking of how everything needs its place and it can't be too busy. So, for example, something I like to do, I usually consider whatever the bass part is, that is sort of the low point, and I kind of work up from there. So usually, right, if you're writing a song, um, you have what I like to call a main instrument, which is usually the instrument that you wrote off of. So if it's a piano ballad, your piano part is going to be your main. If it's a song that you wrote on the acoustic guitar, so like say a Goo Goo Dolls song kind of, kind of feel where like you can tell, you know, Johnny Resnick with his, uh, open guitar, acoustic guitar sound is like the main sort of 
um, instrument. So this is like the instrument that if you were to play an acoustic show and you didn't have your band, what's the instrument you, you would play on as you sang is usually what I consider the main instrument. So you have that, which is going to have its space, usually in the mid. It depends. Maybe your piano part's a little higher than normal. Uh, maybe you are using a capo on your guitar. I don't know. But for the most part, it's going to be pretty mid. And then you have your bass. So then I sort of just fill in between that. I usually am not going to put anything below the bass because the bass is the bass, right? Between the kick drum and the bass, that's that's what I want coming out of my subwoofer. Maybe to thicken up the bass, if it's a higher bass part, I might add um, a synth or something to kind of add to the bass sound so that it almost sounds like it's a part of the bass. But for the most part, I'm not putting any instrument or a second bass or anything below that. So I sort of work my way up and going from C to C, I usually ask myself, okay, is there anything in this octave? And that's just a good way to make sure, say if you have a lot of filler guitar parts, you're not adding even more mids. You already have, you know, at least two electric guitars in the mids and you have a piano in the mids and maybe you have a lead guitar in the mids. You don't want to add even more to the mids, right? You want to maybe bump it up an octave and then go up another octave and do another guitar part just so that sort of fills out the spectrum. So that rule number one, um, or part one of the rule, I guess, is filling the pitch spectrum. Second one is to give each a uh, sort of style and rhythm. So for example, if your chorus has power chords and your power chords are a whole note, so you strum the power chord once and it holds for the whole measure, you don't want everything to do that because then nothing will stick out. It's, it's the same principle as the pitch. The idea is you want something to be able to be picked out and to not just all be in one place so that it's muddy. So rhythm and or style and when these notes are hitting is, is going to help with that. Um, so if you have the guitar part, that, that those power chords, that's just going to be like a whole note. So played through the whole measure, you know, Something, it will help if your piano part doesn't just do that same thing because then it will just sort of blend all together and get more money. But if your piano part is doing arpeggios or something where they're basically doing triplets, for instance, or maybe you have uh, another guitar part that's higher up so that you're covering the whole pitch spectrum thing and you also, you know, maybe you make that staccato to help that stick out and then... Um, maybe it's staccato quarter notes. So even, even if it's just straight up quarter notes, like on every beat, it still is something different that sort of just adds to this soundscape rather than just blending in. Um, and in this case, blending in, in a bad way, um, with your power chords. So there are tons of ways to do this, obviously giving a part, you know, a melody, like a lead part is certainly a helpful way to do this because a melody is usually going to have a non-boring rhythm. Like, it's not going to be something held over for a whole note every time. It's not going to be something that's, you know, straight staccato quarter notes. Um, it, will, it will have some sort of rhythm to it, maybe some syncopation in there. So that's definitely um, one way. I like to have usually at least one or two sort of leads besides the vocal. Um, so... It's, it's, it's sort of like if you're at a party with 10 people, right? And you don't know any of these people. If they're all about the same, are you going to remember any of them? Or will, will you have a better time if there's some different personalities? You know, one person's kind of crazy. One person maybe had a little too much to drink. And another person is, you know, very thought provoking and, and he doesn't speak much, but when he does speak, it's really profound. Like those are the sort of things that will make each of those people stick out. And then you have a good time because, you know, maybe you're a little sick of the loud mouth over there who's being obnoxious and you're like, oh man, this guy's driving me nuts. So you go over to the guy who's really pensive and doesn't talk as much, but when he does say something, it's profound. And then he blows your mind with something that you had never thought of before. So you're going to go home from that party probably with a, a better view on it, right? Because there were some different personalities, things that made each person more memorable. 
and stick out from the other ones. And then it all sort of comes together to make an enjoyable experience for you. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of what you want with all of these different parts. You don't want them all having the same exact style. You, you know, if you have some triplets over here and then you have quarter note staccato over there, and then you have legato, uh, melody that's syncopated over here and then another legato melody that's syncopated in another spot. Like that's the sort of thing that, that fills in the mix. So there's always something new happening. So on that whole note from the power chord, all right, you get the first beat measure, the first beat covered. And then something interesting happens because sort of on that, you know, before the next quarter note, uh, maybe the legato part starts coming in and, then you have your, you know, maybe a, a note or two that's hitting on that, on that second beat. And it just sort of gives something for the listener to attach to at any given time. And then there are different interesting parts, not just like wall of sound for four seconds, wall of sound for four seconds, um, which you can do once in a while maybe to, for a certain effect. Uh, but for the most part, that's not going to work and it's just going to sound clunky. So rule number one was fill the pitch spectrum. Rule number two, or I keep saying rule number one, rule number two. These are all in theory the same rule that everything has its place. So part two of the rule is to give each its different style and rhythm. And then the third one is be intentional about giving each piece its job. So I'm going to throw a football analogy at you and hopefully you've watched a football game or know even just a tiny bit about football to understand what I'm saying this because this is pretty basic but offensive linemen in football or defensive linemen don't need to know how to pass a football right like when you watch a football game usually a quarterback is the one who's passing once in a great while they might do a trick play where a wide receiver passes the ball or something like that but for the most part the quarterback needs to be really good at throwing the ball the quarterback doesn't need to run well and the quarterback doesn't usually need to block very well that's what the offensive lineman's for. They block. And a running back. A running back doesn't necessarily need to be good at catching a ball. They should be adequate because now in the current football way is to have running backs actually catch balls more often. But for the most part, traditionally, a running back mostly needed to be able to carry the ball and power through people or be able to escape around people, whereas wide receivers need to be able to catch the ball. So every position, and this is true of any sport, right? If you're defensive player on a soccer team, you don't have to be great at scoring goals, but you do need to be good at reading an offensive player and knowing what they're going to do so you can intercept their pass or so you can cut off their lane so that they can't get closer to the net. So no matter what sport it is, or even a company, right? Like what a CEO needs to be good at versus a CTO, you know, that who's in charge of technology are two different things. CE, CEO should be really good at vision, and then the CTO should be good at figuring out what technologies to use and what to implement. And that's just true of any team anywhere, whether it's a company or a sports team or anything. And it needs to be true with your music as well. Another analogy would be you can't have too many main characters, right? <laughs> If you have a book or a movie, you can't have five main characters, right? Because then it's, it's just too much. It's overwhelming. And especially if it's a movie, you get like two to three hours to do a movie, right? Like most movies are within that time frame. And to tell the story of five different people and make us care deeply about all five of those people and feel like we have a lot of background in those five people, how do you even accomplish that in only two to three hours, it's going to be pretty tough, which is why most movies have one main character or maybe two. Um, and then you have the funny guy who's like, you know, he, he's a character. He's important to the story. He gives you some laughs, um, but he's not a main character. You're not going to get the same. He's not going to drive the plot forward the way the protagonist will. You just can't have too many starring roles in a movie or in a book. And the same needs to be true with your arrangement, right? So... So, for example, the job of the vocal in most songs is to be that main lead, right? Your vocal is what is communicating the lyrics, so the meaning of the song, and it's the main melody. So, so like, 
maybe even up to 80% of the song is, is in the vocal. Super important. So that's your lead. That's your main. That's your CEO. That's your quarterback. Um, but you can't have too many more of those, right? So um, the, mel- the vocal melody is going to be your main melody. But you can have other melodies, right? Like, for example, you could have a guitar, uh, guitar part that is a lead that also has its own melody. But once you have three lead guitar parts that have distinct melodies, maybe it's starting to get busy. Um, So, in order to sort of think through this, I have three main categories when it comes to arranging. And the first is body, the second is leads, and then the third is filler. So body's the main stuff. This is what the song needs. Your main piano part in a piano ballad, and the guitar power chords for your chorus, and the main guitar part. Uh, So usually an acoustic guitar part. Um, This is the stuff that you would really need to be played if you were playing the song live. The stuff that truly makes the song the song. That's, That's the body. So they have a specific job, right? These are the sort of anchors to your song. These are the truly necessary parts of your song that are what you need to communicate your song to the listener. Leads are melodic parts. So these are parts where you have some melody played with instruments that's prevalent and memorable. It could be a solo, although it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, But the key part here is that it actually has melodies. Um, So not just arpeggios or staccato notes that are on every quarter note. Like, Like, it has to have a melody. 